All right, y'all want to talk some college football today? Y'all want to talk some South Carolina Gamecocks football today? <laughs> hey, good morning. It's Uncle Lou here. Yeah, that's right. It's me, Uncle Lou, live on YouTube for you. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. Also, in addition to that as well, subscribe to this channel. I'm posting these preview and prediction videos nonstop from now to the start of the season. I've done... I think five of them so far. We're going to do about 40 or 50. We're going to do as many as we can between now and about the middle of August, uh, right up until the point where the season is getting ready to start up today is the South Carolina Gamecocks. And I want to give a big shout out to my boy, Colby. What's up, Colby? Hope you're having a good weekend. Colby suggested that I do this South Carolina Gamecocks preview and prediction video. So that's what we's going to do. Appreciate you supporting the channel over on the Patreon page, Colby. All these teams that I do, these preview and prediction videos that I do, the suggestions come from the Patreon page. So, uh, if you're a member on the Patreon page, make sure you go over there, find the post. It's the first post on the page. Leave a comment on that post. Let me know what team you want me to do a preview and prediction for. If you're not on the Uncle Lou Patreon page, what are you doing? I, I, I can't imagine why you wouldn't be. Um, joining the Uncle Lou Patreon page makes you a lot smarter and lowers your cholesterol, too. Which, of course, will get you off that Lipitor, which is killing you from the inside out. There's a link in the description of this video that'll take you over to the Patreon page. You're welcome to have yourself a look around. Let's talk about the Gamecocks. All right, we're going to do this video the same way we do them all. We'll wrap up last season. We'll talk about South Carolina's roster and coaching staff this season, what they lost, who's coming back, all that kind of stuff. Then we're going to put the schedule up on the screen, and we're going to go through it game by game. And I'm going to give you a winner and a loser for every single game on South Carolina's 2023 schedule. All right, year three for our buddy Shane Beamer, right up the road in Columbia, South Carolina. Head coach of the Gamecocks, uh, seven and six his first year, eight and five last year. We'll talk more about last year in a second. So some improvement there from year one to year two. But to me, when I look at South Carolina's trajectory under Shane Beamer, I'm looking less at the win total, which I know in the end is the most important thing. But take a look at South Carolina's recruiting. And here's something to keep in mind. If you go back 13 or 14 years now, uh, when South Carolina had that run under Steve Spurrier, right, where they won, I think it was 11 games in a, uh, they won 11 games three seasons in a row, I believe. I'm right on that. I actually won the SEC East uh, uh, during one of those years as well. If you go back and you look at some of the names that were on that South Carolina rosters during sort of the heyday of the Steve Spurrier tenure at South Carolina, there's going to be a lot of names you'll remember like Marcus Lattimore, Davion Klein, people like that. What you might not know or might not remember is that the recruiting coordinator that, that brought those people in, the recruiting coordinator at South Carolina during that time was Shane Beamer. Shane Beamer doesn't have any head coaching experience when he took over the job at South Carolina, but he had experience at South Carolina, and he was a proven recruiter, and, a, and more importantly, a proven recruiter at South Carolina, which has not been an easy thing to do, whether you're talking about some of the all-time greats who have coached at South Carolina, like Lou Holtz and Steve Spurrier. Now they coached sort of in the twilights of their careers, of course, much more success at their previous schools, but South Carolina hasn't been a place where coaches have been able to come in and recruit at an elite level. And I'm not saying that Shane Beamer is doing that now or that he will be able to do that in the future, but the recruiting under Shane Beamer at South Carolina is trending in the right direction. If you look at the last few recruiting classes, 80th three years ago, 24th two years ago, 16th last year. I mean, that's an obvious trend recruiting-wise in the right direction if you're South Carolina. Now, recruiting is not an overnight fix. We all understand that. You've got to stack these classes on top of each other. But the point I'm trying to make is it's easy to sort of look at Shane Beamer and say, well, South Carolina's a 7-8 win team, and Shane Beamer's winning seven or eight games. What's the, you know, what's the benefit here? Well, the benefit is the potential of a couple of years down the road, right, when some of that talent that he's recruiting, which, again, Whatever you think of South Carolina's recruiting classes, and again, I'm not saying they're elite, they're not top five or anything like that. In fact, even this past year when they finished 16th in the country, that was good for only seventh in the SEC. So I'm not suggesting that South Carolina's about to take over the college football world, but whatever the talent was at South Carolina when Shane Beamer got there, it is steadily increasing year over year since he's been there, and, and that's a good sign. Now, they haven't been as successful in the portal overall. Now, obviously, they brought in some big names over the last couple of years, Spencer Rattler being primary among them. But this year in particular, the portal took a, a, a it took more out of South Carolina than South Carolina got from the portal. Now, South Carolina did go out and get, several, I think, 10 players from the portal. So uh, not that they didn't get anybody, but you look at the quality of player they lost, Jaheim Bell, Marshawn Lloyd, and the quality of player they brought in. I think it was a net loss 
this year for South Carolina in the transfer portal. And again, I'm, I, that's not a knock. I'm, I'm not saying that South Carolina or Shane Beamer's fault. This is kind of the world we live in when it comes to transfer portal. They were a big winner a couple of seasons ago in the portal, getting Spencer Rattler to transfer there. I wouldn't quantify him as a big loser this year in the portal, but I do think they lost more than they uh, lost more than they gained. What did they do last year? Well, we talked about it briefly. We'll mention it now, but they were eight and four in the regular season. They ended up eight and five after losing a great game to Notre Dame in the Gator Bowl. And South Carolina had a weird season, right? They get blown out by Georgia early in the year. They lose kind of a tough one on the road at Arkansas early in the year. And then they ended up also losing to Missouri and Florida, two teams that were not very good last year. And then we all remember how the season ended, right, with wins against top 10 Tennessee at home and then top 10 Clemson on the road. And the feeling was that would sort of slingshot South Carolina forward into 2023 with some positive momentum. And those were two huge wins. Two huge wins. And sort of the biggest question mark to me when I look at South Carolina in 2023 is, am I going to get the South Carolina and more importantly, the Spencer Rattler that I got in the last two games of the regular season when South Carolina beat top 10 opponents in back-to-back weeks, uh, Tennessee and Clemson? Or am I going to get the Spencer Rattler that I saw for the majority of the season prior to that, which was a Spencer Rattler that just wasn't very good? Uh, he had the lowest QBR in the SEC for the majority of the year. He made was able to make some of that up in those last two games, obviously most notably against uh, Tennessee when they scored 60-something points uh, on that defense that doesn't exist um, uh, for the Vols. But I still have questions about Spencer Rattler's consistency. There's no questioning Spencer Rattler's talent and ability. I mean, he was a five-star for a reason, all the hype that went around him, and whatever you think about Lincoln Riley as a head coach or his record in the postseason or whatever else, is there anybody alive that doubts Lincoln Riley's ability to judge quarterback talent? Lincoln Riley can get pretty much any quarterback he wants every single year, and he wanted Spencer Rattler. And, of course, he went out and got him, uh, didn't work out, got benched, Lincoln Riley then, you know, to Southern Cal, Spencer Rattler to South Carolina. We know that whole story. So which Spencer Rattler are we going to get in 2023? Well, on one hand, you think, well, he's going to play a lot better, right? He's more experienced now, his second year in the system. Well, South Carolina has changed offensive coordinators. Um, so, I, you know, it, it's, it's not starting over for Spencer Rattler, but in terms of an offensive philosophy or, or offensive consistency, this will be Spencer Rattler's third offensive coordinator in the last three years. Never a good sign. Uh, doesn't mean Spencer Rattler can't have a good year, but ideally, in a perfect world, you don't want your quarterback being on his third offensive coordinator in three years. Let's look at some numbers for South Carolina, and then we'll talk more about the offense and the defense, and then we'll pull the schedule up. Um, I do a ranking every offseason. In fact, I do three rankings. I do one after signing day in February, one after the spring games in April, and I do a third ranking, which I haven't done yet, around the beginning of August. So I'm on my second of three preseason rankings right now. Where do I have South Carolina ranked in the Uncle Lou Top 25? Unfortunately, they didn't make the Uncle Lou Top 25. Now, if I did an Uncle Lou Top 35, I'd probably have South Carolina somewhere in the 30 to 35 range. These are preseason rankings, and I know everybody does rankings different, and I'm not going to go into detail and explain how I do my rankings on this video. I explain them in the rankings video. My rankings are not a projection for where I think teams will finish. So the fact that I've got South Carolina right now in the offseason ranked probably somewhere between 30 and 35 doesn't necessarily think I mean they're going to finish the season ranked 30 to 35. Maybe they finish worse, maybe they finish better. That's not the point. But the point is, I'm not suggesting that I think South Carolina is going to finish the season ranked somewhere between 30 and 35. My rankings are not a projection. My rankings are an indication of where I feel a team is at the day I make the ranking. In this case, the last week of April, first week of uh, first week of May. Uh, what does the national media think about South Carolina? You know, everybody and their brother puts out rankings these days, right? From ESPN to Fox Sports to Sports Illustrated to um, Athlon to 24-7 sports. I mean, you name it. You've seen 100 preseason slash offseason college football rankings, top 25s, polls, whatever you want to call them. Most of the national rankings have South Carolina unranked. Um, a few of the rankings do like an others receiving votes thing or a uh, you know first five out type of deal. I've seen South Carolina show up in a few places there. But the majority of rankings you look up in terms of a top 25 do not include uh, do not include South Carolina. What does Vegas think about South Carolina in terms of their win totals this year? Now, Vegas has been off on South Carolina's win totals the last couple of years. Um, it looked like Vegas was going to nail it last year, and then sort of out of the blue, of course, South Carolina wins those two big games at the end of the year against top 10 teams, Tennessee and Clemson, which nobody saw coming, ending up with the eight regular season wins. The over-under win total that Vegas has on South Carolina right now for the 2023 season is 6.5. No, you can't win 6.5 games. I, this is a betting number. 
This is for people who bet on college football. So what this is telling you is that the majority of the betting public when it comes to college football looks at South Carolina as somewhere around a six or a seven win team in 2023. If you think they're going to win basically six games or less, you bet the under on six and a half. If you think they're going to win seven games or more, you bet the over on the six and a half. And the over has cashed for South Carolina the last couple of years, but that's the Vegas number right now for South Carolina, looking at about a six or seven win season. What about Heisman candidates up in Columbia? Been a long time since they've had a Heisman winner. Got to go all the way back to 1981, I believe. George Rogers, he was 80 or 81. I believe, I guess it was, well, I don't remember. It was, it was 80 or 81. Wasn't 82. Wasn't 82 because Herschel won it in 82. It was 80 or 81. Uh, running back George, I guess George Rogers, right? Won the Heisman for South Carolina. So, been a while. Uh, when you look at the Heisman list, again, uh, this is a, a betting thing here. You know, you can go to any of these online sports books or wherever you look up your, your betting numbers at. And they'll have odds for the Heisman. They've got Spencer, uh, they've got Spencer Rattler as the highest rated South Carolina player in terms of chances to win. Uh, the Heisman this coming year, and his odds are at plus 6,000, which is not anywhere close to the top. Um, in fact, that puts him in the same category as quarterbacks like Cam Rising uh, from Utah, who we're not even sure is going to start the season because of an injury, um, and Tyler Buckner, the throwaway from Notre Dame that has ended up at Alabama and hopes that he'll be Nick Saban's savior, uh, a hope that is going to end up being futile, um, by the way, in two. Uh, what about Nash? That puts uh, Spencer Rattler twenty uh, eighth. Uh, if if you if you go down the list, Spencer Rattler twenty eighth best odds for the Heisman at plus six thousand. What about South Carolina's chances at a national title? Don't click off the video or start laughing. I, look, nobody's picking South Carolina to win a national title, but you can bet on these things. And the odds for South Carolina to win a national title in two thousand and twenty three currently sit at plus fifteen thousand. That puts them at twenty seventh in the country. So 26 teams with a better chance to win a national title this year than South Carolina, according to the people that put these numbers together out in Vegas. That gives them the exact same odds as teams like Kentucky, Miami, um, Auburn, and Iowa. Um, those teams all have plus 15,000 odds. So, that again, this, this just gives you an idea of what people's perception is of South Carolina heading into the season. Clearly, we've seen from the last two years that people have been undervaluing South Carolina. So I'm not suggesting that any of these numbers are accurate. I'm just saying that's what – well, the numbers are accurate as of right now. I mean, these are Vegas numbers. Um, but the fact that nobody's got South Carolina ranked isn't necessarily an indication of them finishing the season unranked, right? People have been wrong before. All right, let's talk about the offense, the defense, the coaching staff. Then we're going to put the schedule up on the screen and go through it from there. I already talked about uh, uh, quarterback Spencer Rattler. He's got to have a better year. Now, obviously, if he played like he played the last two weeks of the regular season every single week of the year, you're getting ideal Spencer Rattler. And that's what South Carolina needs, especially considering some of the pieces they lost on offense. I still have questions about Spencer Rattler's consistency. We'll see if he can prove me wrong in 2023. He's obviously a gifted and talented quarterback, very athletic, very mobile. He's got a good arm. He just plays too up and down for me. It's hard to be confident in Spencer Rattler for, from week to week, at least in what we've seen from his time at Oklahoma and then last year, um, uh, last year at uh, South Carolina. New offensive coordinator, uh, Dowell, first of all, is that even right? I don't know why someone named Dowell is not a first name. So why this person is named that uh, is beyond me, but his name is, da uh, da and then his last name ain't no better. It's not Logan's. It's L L Logan's, Logan's, L-O-G-G-A-I-N. I don't understand. It's like a contest now to see who can come up with the weirdest names. And don't even get me started on like Kool-Aid McKinstry and you know, Smoke Bowie and uh, 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 Kentucky's got a guy named Cavassier, uh, Cavassier Smoke. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Again, I don't name these people. No, that's not my job. My job is just to pronounce their names wrong. So shout out to Dow Logan's new offensive coordinator, uh, working with Spencer Rattler in the South Carolina offense. Wide receiver Juice Williams. Now he's really, really good, and he's he comes back. He'll be a problem for anybody South Carolina plays. Uh, whatever, whatever team's best corner is, that's who you're going to want to put on Juice Williams. He's a playmaker and he will make some plays. Running back, offensive line, and tight end, to me, all three are concerns about South Carolina heading into 2023. We'll start with the running back situation. They lose Marshawn Lloyd. Now, I get it. When you're a fan, the glass is always half full. So you lose Marshawn Lloyd, and you go, well, he was hurt a lot. So, okay, he might have been hurt a lot last year, year before, whatever, but, but he was the best running back on your team. And if he was on your team today, he'd be the best running back on your team. 
Um, doesn't mean he'd stay healthy, but I, you know, who knows? And that's a crapshoot for anybody. But saying, well, he can't stay healthy, so we don't need him. I mean, you might as well say that about every player you have then, because any player can get hurt at any given time. But the reality is, he was your best running back. Facts. And he's on the West Coast now at, at Southern Cal in a high flying offense. Um, that, that's just not a net win for South Carolina. Uh, it's not a net win for South Carolina to uh, lose him. You got Juju McDowell. He's your leading returning rusher. He had 200 yards last year. Well, he had, but between two and three, he had less than 300 yards. Was it 280 something, 250 yards, whatever he had. That's just not a recipe for success at the running back position. Combined with the fact that offensive line is another big concern for me. Yeah, you know, left tackle was injured during the spring game. Who knows what's going to happen with that? Is he going to be able to make it back in time? And again, even though uh, Shane Beamer and South Carolina have been recruiting better than what South Carolina is used to, there's they're just not in a position like some of these other teams are that when they lose a starter. You know, your Georgias, your Bamas, your Ohio States, these teams that recruit in the top five, six, seven every year, they lose an offensive lineman. The The offensive lineman they're putting in to replace them is the drop-off is not that bad. When you look at South Carolina's offensive line last year, it wasn't great. Now you lose your left tackle. You lose your best running back. It seems to me like South Carolina is going to have a hard time running the ball in 2023, which is even more of a reason to be concerned about Spencer Rattler. He's going to have to play more consistently. He's going to have to win games with his arm, I think, because I just I don't think South Carolina's running game um, is going to beat very many people up. I don't think they're going to win very many games. Um, I don't think they're going to win very many games uh, uh, running the ball. At tight end, they lose Jaheim Bell. I think one of the best tight ends in the country last year, not named Brock Bowers, not saying he's the second best, but I'm saying if you put together a list of 10, he's on it. He's gone to Florida State. Uh, you replace him with Trey Knox, who's, you know, okay. He's a transfer from Arkansas. Which that's where the offensive coordinator came to, uh, came from, too, uh, by the way. This guy that's got a weird name with the dole leggings and that. Uh, so you get him and the tight end, Trey Knox. And Trey Knox is good. He's not Jaheim Bell. So, again, this is what I was talking about when I talked about the transfer portal being a net loss for South Carolina this year. Um, you, you lose Marshawn Lloyd. You don't bring in anybody of a Marshawn Lloyd caliber you only had two running backs on your ro- uh, scholarship running backs on your roster during spring practice you had to take uh what's the guy's name he played he plays quarterback and wide receiver for you he's kind of one of these uh you know like if you look him up on 24 7 it'll tell you he's an athlete um what's his name did i write it down another one with a weird name to carry on joiner whatever the hell these people with their names again uh, but anyway he's a quarterback and a wide receiver he's been at south carolina forever four or five years he's played a lot of wide receiver he's played a lot of quarterback not in spring practice, though. In spring practice, he played running back. Not saying that's bad and not saying he's a terrible running back, but it just goes to show how bad the South Carolina running back situation is overall. You're down to only two scholarship running backs. you got to bring basically a quarterback in um, to give you depth there at the running back room for spring. It just I'm worried about South Carolina this year offensively. Outside of Spencer Rattler and Juice Williams at wide receiver, there's just really not anything about South Carolina's offense that 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 would worry you, I don't think, as a defense. Combined with the fact that Spencer Rattler's on his third offensive coordinator in three years, not a recipe for success there. I think South Carolina's offense, especially early in the season, is going to be shaky, um, shaky at best. Uh, let's look over on the defensive side of the ball. Now, defensive side of the ball doesn't get much better. You only returned four starters from last year's defense. Now, this is a defense that couldn't stop a nosebleed when it comes to run defense. They were absolutely horrendous against the run. I think they were 13th in the SEC against the run. Now, their pass defense numbers were pretty good. And look, they had a good secondary. So don't take what I'm about to say the wrong way. They had a really good secondary. They had a cornerback that was taken. And was he taken in the first round? First round, second round, uh, Cam Smith, was that his name? Uh, Really, really good. And you had some other DBs that were really good, too, that are coming back. And I'm going to talk about them in a second. But you're kidding yourself if you don't think that one of the reasons South Carolina's overall defensive numbers against the pass looked as good as they did is because teams just didn't need to throw the ball against Carolina. Their their run defense didn't exist. It was horrible. You could line up and just run the ball over and over and over again against South Carolina, and chances are you're going to get a first down every two or three plays. It was that bad. So they've got to get better there. The problem is they lost the majority of their front seven. Now, you might say, well, that's good if they were that bad. Maybe. We'll see. Uh, Very inexperienced, though, this year along the front seven uh, because of that. Like I mentioned, only four starters back. You do get a linebacker back from injury that has some promise and potential. So, 
you know, maybe he can play well. And I mentioned the secondary. You got a lot back. You lose the, the, the guy to the NFL, but you got a couple of safeties that were freshmen last year that were pretty good. Should be even better. Uh, should be even better uh, this year. And you've got pieces at cornerback, I think, that can fill in. I think South Carolina's secondary will be good again in 2023. There was only 12 teams in the country that had more interceptions last year than South Carolina. Defensively, I'm talking. Uh, they were 13th in the country in interceptions as a defense. So ball hawking secondary, it is a good pass defense. I'm not, I'm not saying the pass defense isn't good, but it might not have been quite as good as the numbers indicated because teams, when they lined up to play South Carolina, you could pretty much abandon the pass and just cram it down their throat uh, for the entirety uh, for the entirety of the game. All right, there you go. Let's put the schedule up on the screen and go through it game by game. All right, there you go. There's a look at South Carolina's schedule for 2023, which, of course, we're going to go through game by game here right now, and I'm going to give you a winner and a loser um, for every single game on the schedule. But a couple of just uh, personal notes here about uh, about South Carolina and about this schedule. Uh, it's a sad day for Uncle Lou. This is looks like this is going to be the last year of Georgia and South Carolina playing a game every single year. It looks like that's going away with the addition of Texas and Oklahoma to the SEC, a revamped schedule, doing away with divisions. Um, all that the schedule was recently released for 2024 and of course Georgia and South Carolina are not playing now South Carolina is not a rival of Georgia and I get that and when you add teams to a league I know that you have to lose games and I'm not complaining necessarily um, from from a from a Georgia point of view that they're not playing South Carolina Um, my complaints are purely personal if you've been around this channel for a while you've heard me say this probably a bunch of times but I live in Augusta Georgia which is on the border of South Carolina. In fact, the ter- first town over is called North Augusta, South Carolina, right across the Savannah River. So growing up, I just I, I knew a lot of people that were South Carolina Gamecock fans. Also in Augusta, Georgia, every Friday night, but the day before the Georgia-South Carolina game, they have a huge, basically, festival down here called the Border Bash. And in any given year, there's twenty or 25,000 people that show up for this thing. They've got live music, bands, all types of merchandise tents. The cheerleaders from both teams come down. The mascots from both teams come down. It's just been a huge thing here in this area for really the majority of my lifetime. So for those two reasons, growing up with a lot of Gamecock fans, going to this border bash year after year after year for the better part of the last 25 years, I have come to really appreciate the Georgia-South Carolina game, even though I completely understand and know it's not a rivalry and not considered a rivalry by the majority of college football. But I'm still sad to see this game end um, on a year-to-year basis. And yet another reason why I really hope the SEC gets it together with their scheduling goes to a nine-game schedule with a 3-6-6 model. I know South Carolina won't be one of those three teams that Georgia plays every year, but if they go to the 366 model, at least Georgia and South Carolina can continue to play every other um, every other year. The other thing, sort of on a personal note, I want to mention about South Carolina and his schedule and sort of just the Gamecocks in general is I have been wrong about South Carolina the last couple of years. Now, to my credit, so has everyone else. There's not a soul on planet Earth who saw South Carolina ending the season last year with wins against Tennessee and Clemson. I don't care whose predictions you go back and watch on YouTube or read on the internet or the the, the magazines that come out every June, ESPN, off-season shows. Nobody saw that happening at the end of the year. Now, a huge credit to South Carolina for getting the job done, but the fact that I was wrong about South Carolina last year, so was everyone else. But Keep that in mind as you see me go through this preview today. Just because I predict it today doesn't necessarily mean it's going to come true. But here we go. Let's start with the schedule. A great game here to open up. I'm looking forward to this game a lot. Uh, South Carolina versus North Carolina. A border war, uh, right? The border war. These are two obvious uh, bordering states here. And a great quarterback battle. Drake May, quarterback at North Carolina. Spencer Rattler, quarterback at uh, South Carolina. And neither one of these teams have much of a defense to speak of. Now, South Carolina does have a big edge in the secondary versus North Carolina, and that could end up being a factor in this game. We'll see. Um, Drake May comes back at North Carolina, but he loses his top two wide receivers. Their defense, which was just horrendous last year, North Carolina, they they kept their defensive coordinator, Gene Chizik, which I think was a mistake. North Carolina is going to have to play way better defensively in this game if they want to win it than what they played last year. Same true for South Carolina, though. Can Spencer Rattler... Because, look, Spencer Rattler played great those last two weeks, right? But I don't think there's anybody alive who thinks Spencer Rattler had a better season last year than Drake May. 
Um, Drake May was considered a Heisman candidate for the majority of the season. Spencer Rattler and the word Heisman were never even uttered in the same sentence, okay? And that's not a knock on Spencer Rattler. That's just uh, it goes to show you how good of a year Drake May has as his first year as a starter. He's coming back. Got to find a couple of receivers to place uh, to replace, but I think this North Carolina offense could be really, really good. I won't be at all surprised to see Drake May in the Heisman conversation again in 2023 when we get into November and that kind of talk really starts to ramp up. I think this is going to be a great game. And kind of like the FSU-LSU game that I've predicted a few days ago, you can go back and watch the Florida State or LSU videos if you haven't seen those. To me, this is a hard game to pick. Um, I'll be honest, a lot of times by the time I sit down and do all the research to make these videos, by the time it gets to the point of my note-taking that I'm predicting the schedule, it's usually pretty easy. I usually have a pretty good idea of which teams I think a team is going to beat and which teams I think a team is going to lose to. Not the case with this South Carolina-North Carolina game. I can see a scenario where South Carolina wins the game. Spencer Rattler would have to play well. That defensive secondary would probably have to come up with an interception or two, which they had no problem doing last year, so no reason to think they couldn't do it again. I can see a scenario where North Carolina wins, where Drake May comes out. He's hot. Their defense has improved a little bit. Spencer Rattler maybe plays like the Spencer Rattler we saw at the beginning of last season as opposed to the Spencer Rattler we saw at the end of the season. I can see North Carolina winning. I'm going to go with North Carolina in this game, and it pains me to do that. No, I don't like South Carolina. They're my most hated team, but I am a big SEC homer. And, look, I'll be pulling for the Gamecocks in this one. I like to see the SEC win these non-con games. The reality is it came down to this for me. I just trust Drake May more at this point than I do Spencer Rattler. If this is a one-possession game in the fourth quarter, I would rather have Drake May than Spencer Rattler. So for that reason, I'm picking North Carolina to win a close one. Furman, week two at home in-state FCS program. South Carolina gets the win there. And then the SEC schedule starts. And these are three tough games here. Um, and two of them are on the road. At Georgia, um, Georgia absolutely destroyed South Carolina last year in Columbia. I think it was 48-6. to six. The game was over 10 minutes into the game. I don't know that Georgia will run away with that a game like they did last year. But right now, anyway, South Carolina's not at a point where they're going to be competing with Georgia, and I don't expect this game to be close. If you're looking for an upset to happen here, Carson Beck's going to be a new starting quarterback for Georgia. He's never started a game. Now he's been in Athens forever. He's a senior. He's been there four years. This is his fourth year. Uh, but he's never started. Got a lot of talent. One Gatorade player of the year in the state of Florida. No reason to think that he's going to be terrible. Also, no reason to think that he's going to be great. It's just because we've never really seen him play. He's been a fourth quarter kind of mop-up type of guy. He did get some significant playing time last year with the number of blowouts Georgia had in the regular season and in the national title game. He led a couple of scoring drives there in the fourth quarter. I think Carson Beck's going to have a good year. I think he's going to be fine. Georgia's wide receiver room is loaded. they got the best player in America in Brock Bowers, and they've got an NFL offensive line. Probably just, at least a, it's a top three offensive line in college football. Um, Alabama, Georgia, Michigan, top three offensive lines in college football, in my opinion. You can argue about the order. Argue with your mama. Uh, but Georgia will win this game. Um, Georgia will win this game. Um, interesting side note here. Uh, Georgia currently has, I believe, the second longest home winning streak in all of college football behind Alabama, if I'm remembering that right. Georgia's won about 16, 17, 18 home games in a row, something like that. Georgia's last home loss to South Carolina in 2019. So, of course, anything can happen in the world of college football, but for prediction purposes, I think Georgia gets the job done here. Uh, South Carolina's one and two. Then you come back home and you play Mississippi State. Mississippi State changing things up this year. No more throwing the ball 60 times a game. Unfortunately, the passing of Mike Leach um, led to the promotion of defensive coordinator Zach Arnett to head coach out there in Starkville. You get this game at home, which is a big benefit for South Carolina. Those cowbells are annoying as shit. Um, out there uh, in in Starkville. Nobody likes to deal with that crap. It's fucking annoying, honestly. You get them at home. South Carolina does have a good home environment. In fact, they have a great home environment. I think South Carolina wins this game. Um, it's not going to be any fun to root against Mississippi State this year just because of the circumstances that have gone on there, the untimely passing sort of out of the blue might lead you at the end of last season. And I'm not saying Zach Arnett can't be successful there. He was the defensive coordinator under Mike Leach, but he he's trying to flip the whole offense over and sort of, instead of throwing the ball 60 times a game, go to more of a pro style, um, you know, kind of line of scrimmage game, a lot more running the ball. Uh, they still have Will Rogers, and he's still a dangerous quarterback, maybe the most underrated quarterback in all of college football. It's kind of the problem of playing quarterback for Mike Leach. No matter how good you are, Mike Leach is going to get a majority of the credit for it, right? 
But Will Rogers is a good quarterback. South Carolina secondary will be tested um, in that game. But I think South Carolina wins the game. They're 2-2. Two and two. And then on the road at Tennessee, a revenge game for Knoxville. This time, a home game for Tennessee. And I just don't think South Carolina can win the game. I, you know, I know they beat them last year, and congratulations. That's one of the biggest wins South Carolina's had probably since that 2019 win against Georgia. Um, a really big win for uh, for South Carolina. And I personally love to see it. It was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. And I spent about a week laughing at the Tennessee man about that game. With the game being in Knoxville, though, I just can't predict another upset. I mean, there's a reason it was so shocking that South Carolina beat Tennessee. And unfortunately, the reason is Tennessee's just a better team right now than South Carolina is. Again, that doesn't the better team doesn't always win. That's why we play these games. If the better team won every single week, there'd be no point in going through and doing this um, prediction video. We just say, well... South Carolina's better than these six teams, so they're going six and six. We all know that doesn't happen. Every team in the country wins some games they're not supposed to and loses some games they're not supposed to most of the time, right? But, again, I just don't see South Carolina pulling the upset on the road. It would be the second year in a row. I I, I don't see it. I, it you know, is Tennessee's defense going to have some miraculous turnaround this year? No, I think they're still going to be bottom of the, uh, uh, you know, bottom half of the league, bottom half of the country in terms of a lot of these defensive numbers. I also don't see a scenario where South Carolina puts up 60 points again. I think since uh, Tennessee gets the win, South Carolina's two and three heading into their bye week. Come out of the bye week and you play Florida. The third weirdest game for South Carolina last year was the Florida game, right? Obviously, everybody talks about the wins against Clemson and Tennessee to close out the regular season, and those were huge wins. Sort of lost in that conversation is the fact that right before you beat ten, a top 10 Tennessee and Clemson team, you got absolutely donkey stomped by a terrible Florida team. Something, what was this, 35 to 6, 38 to 6? You talk about a game that no, that that you look back on it and you go, how did that happen? Knowing that South Carolina was good enough to beat Clemson in Tennessee, but the week before that, they were not good enough to beat Florida. Very strange. Very strange. I think you can beat them this year. You get them coming off of a bye week. I don't think Florida is going to be. I, I don't think Florida is going to be better than they were last year, and they weren't very good last year. I think Florida is a borderline bowl team in 2023. Now, unfortunately, I think the same thing for South Carolina in terms of overall record. But um, all records aren't the same when it comes to college football. I think we all know that a lot depends on um, you know. There's different things to go into that, but I think South Carolina is a better team than Florida right now. You get this game at home, two weeks to prepare. Billy Napier, huge shock here, doesn't know what he's doing. Sunbelt Billy in over his head. They've got no quarterback. Florida, they bring Graham Mertz in from Wisconsin. It's an absolute disaster waiting to happen. The offensive line is gone from last year. They still have got that running back ETN. He's good. They've got that wide receiver, Ricky Pearsall. He is good. Outside of that, they've got absolutely nothing. I do think their defense might be a little bit better than last year. I like some of the uh, coaching changes Florida made defensively. But the talent level at Florida is just not where it needs to be. I think South Carolina at home gets the win over Florida. Uh, so, what, you're 3-3 three and three now? Uh, on the road at Mizzou. <laughs> You've lost to Missouri five years in a row? Did I read that right when I was researching for this video today? I, that might be the most embarrassing stat in all of college football. I'm just going to come right out and say it and be honest with you. If you'd ask me, name somebody that Missouri has beaten five times in a row, in my mind, I'm immediately going back to Missouri's Big 12 days and thinking, well, did they beat Kansas maybe five years in a row? Um, did they maybe beat, like, a down Texas Tech team five years? Like, I, like, I'm just immediately throwing anybody out. and Like, no, there's no way anybody in the SEC has lost to them five years in a row. It seems like I read that, though, when I was doing that. You've got to beat Missouri. I know it's on the road, and, you know, that is what it is. And, you know, SEC home crowds can be daunting and intimidating. Not Mizzou. I didn't buy it last year when people tried to use that as an excuse for Georgia struggling on the road up there. Oh, Missouri at night's a tough place to play. There was some Georgia Homer um, YouTube people who like to call other people on YouTube idiots that have been spending the better part of the last eight months bitching, crying, moaning, and complaining about how hard it is to play on the road at Mizzou. No, it is not hard to play at Mizzou. That, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Um, South Carolina should get this win on the road at Missouri. You got to get to if that's true about the five thing years, and I should have looked it up instead of just believing what I read. You got to get you got to beat a Missouri team. They've been five hundred three years in a row under Drinkwitz. They can't break out. Some people think this will be a better year for Mizzou. 
it, you got to win this game on the road at Missouri, and I think you do, especially back to back road games. Because then you get to go at Texas A and M. Yeah, I know you beat Texas A and M last year. You beat Clemson and Tennessee last year too. Congratulations. Uh, Texas A and M was terrible, and you beat them at home. You've been playing Texas A and M every single year for the for the last ten or eleven years. They're your permanent cross division rival from the SEC West. You beat them last year. For the first time, they had beat you every other year they've been in the SEC that you've played. So you're like one in nine against them or whatever it is. I don't think you win this game on the road at Texas A&M. From purely a record standpoint, I think Texas A&M might be one of the most improved teams in the country in 2023. They're just not losing seven, eight games two years in a row. I don't see it happening. Um, I, you know, Have I been wrong before? Yeah. Am I going to be wrong about that? I don't think so. Um, but I think they get you at home. Uh, you take another. Uh, you take another loss there. So how many losses is that now? One, two, three, four losses. Four and four with four games to go. Jacksonville State at home, FCS opponent. That'll be a win. You're five and four. Five and four. Vanderbilt at home. I think you win that one. Vanderbilt's another team. I think it's going to be better this year. They have an over under of three and a half wins. I think they breeze past that, but I don't think they beat South Carolina. Um, I think you get the win at home. You're six and four. And then you got Kentucky and Clemson. Is it six and four? Right. We'll go back and add it up in a second. Uh, six and four, right. But then you get Kentucky at home and Clemson at home. I think you can beat Kentucky. Now, I, I'm I'm on the fence when it comes to Kentucky. Okay. They lose Will Levis. They bring in Devin Leary. I can't really figure out whether that's an upgrade, a downgrade, or just holding steady at the quarterback position. I'm having a hard time sort of debating in my head Will Levis versus Devin Leary. I think they'll have a good offensive line again. They might be better at the wide receiver position than they've been in a while. They do lose a running back to the transfer portal. They got to replace some things on defense, but, you know, Stoops is going to have them well coached. They always play really well along the line of scrimmage. This is always one of the most physical teams every single year in the SEC. I mean, people love to talk about Georgia and Bama. Kentucky's in that next rung right there with them. Um, Kirby Smart talks about it all the time, how physical Kentucky is and how beat up you are every time after you play them. But I think South Carolina can get that win at home. And then final game of the year, in-state rival against the Taters, um, Clemson. And look, Clemson's got some questions too. Another new offensive coordinator, their second, uh, this will be, this will be their third offensive coordinator in three years, right? It didn't work out with the one they hired last year. They got rid of him. Uh, they brought in Garrett Riley from TCU, brand new quarterback there with Cade Klubnick. And there's a lot of hype around Cade Klubnick. And I'm not saying the kid doesn't have potential, but go look at his numbers from last year. He threw more interceptions than he did touchdowns. And there ain't no wide receivers on Clemson's roster that worry anybody. They lost a ton off of their defense to the NFL. I think South Carolina beats Clemson for the second year in a row. I just changed my mind on the fly. When I wrote all this down, I've got Clemson winning. I just changed my mind in real time on here on Lutube. I cannot buy into the Clemson hype. I, look, Clemson's not going to be terrible. Some people say, well, Clemson's dead or seven and five. Clemson's not going seven and five. They're still the talented, the most talented or maybe second most talented team in the ACC. It's them or Florida State. Still a really good team. And, yeah, they lost a lot on defense, but they've recruited well over there. They're going to replace a lot of that with super talented people. It's their offense that still concerns me. K Club has got potential, but so did DJ Ukulele, and the guy never got out of neutral. They haven't fixed the wide receiver position. Dabo Swinney won't take his head out of the sand when it comes to the transfer portal. There are obvious holes and weaknesses when you look at Clemson that could easily be filled with the transfer portal. Clemson is a team that is designed to use the transfer portal to fill in holes. You know, you're, 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 these teams that recruit like Clemson and Georgia does, they don't need to go out and get 10 and 15 guys from the portal. You look at your roster every single year and you say, where are we? Uh, where do we need depth? You know, where are we the weakest? And you go and you pluck one or two guys out. That I don't, Why Dabo can't get that through his thick skull is beyond me. I think he's purposely not using the portal so that when he loses, he has yet another reason to cry. Um, and, and the reality is I just can't take a college football program seriously that's got a McDonald's play palace in their players' lounge. I'm not sure what's going on at Clemson, but to me it's concerning and alarming. I think South Carolina beats them for the second year in a row. All right, so if I'm adding that up right, that puts South Carolina at 8-4, and four, according to Uncle Lou. And I'm going to be honest, that's a better record than I thought I would have given South Carolina before I sat down to make this video. If you'd have asked me yesterday what I thought about South Carolina, I would have said borderline type of bowl uh, team. But 
I, I kind of like the way the schedule plays out. I'll tell you what worries me here. I've got them at eight and four. It does feel to me like this is a seven and five team, even after doing it. I'm just having a hard time nailing down the fifth loss. We can talk about some possibilities. Um, the back-to-back road games at Mizzou and at Texas a and I've got you losing to Texas A&M and beating um, Mizzou. You could lose to Mizzou, and before you say no, we couldn't, well, they've beat you five years in a row, so yeah, you could. And I've got you beating Florida. Florida, when you know, beating Florida and Mizzou, you know, there is probably a 50% chance, maybe a little over a 50% chance that you do end up losing one of those two games. But that's what makes these types of prediction videos, at least for me, so hard to do. It, it, it's one thing to just look at a schedule and go, ah, eh, seven and five. Pinpointing those five losses, that becomes the problem. And if I can't decide at least on a 70 to 75% surety that I think a team is going to lose a game, then I, I I just I can't force myself to count it as a loss. Um, and, of course, I've got you beating Clemson at the end of the year, which anybody with half a brain will tell you that's obviously a game that South Carolina could lose. You could lose the Kentucky game. You could lose the Mizzou or Florida game. So I'm going to – I mean, i got to do what I came up with here, which is eight and four, but this looks like a seven and five schedule to me. All right, appreciate everybody tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure and let me know down below where you think I'm wrong. And don't just tell me how many losses you think they're going to have. If you disagree with me, you got to tell me who it is you think they're going to lose to. Um, any idiot can look at the schedule and say seven and five. Tell me the five teams if that's what you think. All right, hope you enjoyed the video. Have a great weekend and an even better morning too.